So here we are now uh, to talk about Webb Keen's Varieties of Ethical Stance, taken from four lectures on ethics. Uh, we'll be reading another piece by Vina Das next week. Um, you'll have noticed, of course, that this is a longer piece of writing, so this is going to take a little bit longer to get through. There's a lot of material here. He opens up with the assertion that humans are ethical creatures, that this is just an aspect of who and what we are. Uh, it, it's like saying humans are creatures with skin. It's the same level of uh, intrinsic quality for him. So uh, he'll develop this further, but for now, what's important is that in his view, this is just a pervasive part of everyday life for us, that we take ethical positions, we take them on our own action, we take them on the actions of other people. Um, even if these positions that we take are sort of hab habitual or instinctual positions, things perhaps that we, we can't fully articulate, uh, and yet we take these positions. Now, on the other hand, uh, we need only think about how constantly we talk in ethical terms to see what a constitutive feature uh, ethical concerns are of ordinary life. So anthropologists have grappled with these two senses, the unconscious and conscious ethical behavior in different ways. One tradition, uh, places an emphasis on the role of rules in our lives, obligations, constraints, norms, and we can describe these, we can debate about them. The other focuses on, to quote uh, Keen, the flow of experience, embodiment, institutions, and unselfconscious habits, and tends to be suspicious of talk and effort. So Keen doesn't find a particular merit in opting for only one against the other tradition. Instead, he adopts this kind of broad definition of ethical life as encompassing people's actions and sense of self and of others with reference to, quote, values and ends that are not in turn defined as the means to some further ends so that they are ends in themselves. The important thing for him is not whether they're conscious or unconscious, but rather to encompass both of these tendencies around values and ends that are not in turn defined as the means to some further ends. So that they're not things that have a simple instrumental value, in other words. In a comparable way then, Keen notes that while philosophical approaches to ethics tend to take third-person perspectives on ethics, so the emphasis on rules, sort of the emphasis on a, so to speak, a God's eye view of a situation. And he thinks one of the merits of anthropological approaches to ethics is their sensitivity to first-person perspectives. So how ethics look from the point of view of the actor. But again, he sort of thinks that the first person, third person opposition, it's a bit of a false opposition. Uh, each one has its merits, each one has its limitations. And once again, he's going to make the case that an anthropological approach should really be sensitive to both of these tendencies, not favoring one at the expense of the other. When he poses the question, what is an ethical actor? He notes that neither the first nor the third person gives a complete answer, in part because of how uh, the individuals consider, the individual considers ethics within a cultural milieu, and that milieu influences maybe not in a determining way, the individual's conclusions, especially given that the range of beings falling within the scope of ethics is not fixed 
even within a particular milieu. So if you were to take the, uh, let, let's just say the United States as, uh, as if it were a single cultural or ethical milieu. Um, I, I don't think it is, but for the simplicity's sake, let's just take this as a make-believe example. You could point to the fact that within the population of the United States, there are different views on whether things like deities are part of ethical life or not. So that his point is that even within a particular milieu, you're not going to find this kind of homogeneity amongst everyone on what sorts of beings are um, have an ethical quality to toward them. Uh, you can also think in the US about the variety of positions on something like animal rights. Are, do animal animals, non-human animals that is, fall within the scope of ethics or not? There are different differing views on the extent to which the answer is yes or no to that. So then once again, you, you can have a plurality of uh, positions on what kinds of beings are included within the ethical. Keane ta takes ethics, quote, to center on the question of how one should live and what kind of person one should be. But we should take this idea broadly. It's not just a matter of self-cultivation. It encompasses both one's relations to others and decisions about right and wrong acts. The sense of should refers to values, meaning things that are taken by the actor to be good in their own right rather than as a means to some other end. So again, we're revisiting this theme of an end in themselves, not a means to something else. Now he follows Bernard Williams, a philosopher whose name has arisen already in some of the other readings we've looked at, um, in Williams' critique of the dominance of deontology in the philosophy of ethics and morality. Uh, you may remember from a previous lecture, deontology is associated with Immanuel Kant and uh, with the idea of uh, morality organized around ideas of duty and moral law. So Bernard Williams is critical of the dominance that deontology has had in the philosophy of ethics and morality. And in his depiction of the morality system, again, built around obligation, blame, general principles, the likes of which you get with Kant with something like the categorical imperative, perhaps, as just one understanding of ethics among others, but one that also obscures others. So then the morality system is just one part of a larger, uh, say, range of ethics. It's, it's part of the larger field of ethics, but it has a way of dominating that field and obscuring other approaches to ethics. Keane thinks it's better to consider ethics in relation to manner of life. Um, what is a manner of life? So for ethics, uh, that, that's ethics for Keane and for Williams is a question of virtues, right? So that the manner of life is attached to the virtues that you embody or that you attempt to embody rather than sort of discrete rule governed moral decisions as if you can take this particular event consider it uh, with respect to a set of rules and arrive at a decision just about this as if that's what doing ethics is no he's he's going to say when you approach it through this idea of a manner of life you bring in um the the notion of ethics and what kind of being it is that you want to be and that you strive to be. So a question of character might also arise in that. Now a further distinction between ethics and morality is that you can ponder these discrete 
rule governed decisions and obligations on your own. So you can do deontological reasoning on your own. Ethics, he wants to insist, have a social nature. The ethical life is a life shared with others. And this is going to be a thread that runs through much of Keynes' thinking on this topic. This notion that ethics is irreducibly social. In this picture, ethics are not constraints on action, but rather they facilitate action. They give people the ability to act in ethical ways or act in ways that are oriented towards an ethic. It provides them with goals so that you can aspire to be a certain kind of ethical being. At base then, what's so pressing for Keane is that because the meaning values hold are public, shared, social in nature, one's own sense of self-worth is something that others can grasp. Why? Because you're employing the same kinds of terms, the same kinds of frameworks, the same shared public vocabulary for describing ethical actions. He says, the ethical life cannot be just a private matter. I want to argue that the role of others is crucial, not just as objects of one's ethical concerns or acts, but for the very recognizability of concerns or acts as falling within an ethical realm altogether. So that in other words, you don't decide just for yourself what kind of an act is ethical in nature, that these are matters of public agreement. When we come to uh, Vina Das's piece, we'll return to this uh, question of agreement, uh, so that agreement is not going to be quite such a, a simple thing as, as it may seem from what I just said. So, okay, on to ethics as awareness. An important aspect of ethics and morality is moral dumbfounding. This is a, a, a term that Keane is borrowing from Jonathan Haidt, uh, who's a social psychologist. Moral dumbfounding, then. There are those background assumptions, values, and motives that an actor can find difficult to conceptualize or articulate clearly. They're, they're this sort of murky background that give you perhaps what feels like an instinctual response to something, ethical in nature, that is, that you can recognize that you feel a certain way about the thing and, and that you feel convinced of an ethical position, but you, you can't articulate clearly, even to yourself, why it is that you've arrived at, at that particular position. So it's these things that are kind of the, the background, what's sedimented in place, that it's very hard for you to recognize. They are therefore dumbfounding dumbfounding in the sense that you find it hard to say how it is that you arrived at this position. Even though you're going to have strong ethical intuitions, it will remain, in a sense, at the level of intuition and not easily articulated. So now recognizing this opens the discussion of explicitness versus implicitness, tacit versus explicit, right? So that the things are tacit or that are implicit are the ones that are going to be the most difficult to articulate because they fall under this sort of cloud of taken for grantedness. So then what remains taken for granted and what do we find the need to articulate? What conditions, Keen asks, include explicitness and what are its consequences? He thinks it's help, it, it helps to be clear about the stakes involved if we turn to the distinction between causes and reasons for action. The idea here is that, quote, for an action to count as ethical, it must be directed or justified in the light of some values recognized as ethical by the actor, which in turn requires both some degree of autonomy from natural causality or social pressure, 
So one could have done otherwise. And some quality of self-awareness. One must know what one is doing. Self-awareness and autonomy. Autonomy we've already encountered again in the past with Kant. The, this ability to act freely, give yourself your own law in mm -hmm. Kant's uh, moral philosophy. Um, here I think it just it nods toward the possibility of freedom to act under your own steam rather than simply as the predetermined outcome of natural causes. And then the other part, some quality of self-awareness. Opposing the autonomy and self-awareness tradition of traditional ethics are claims from, for example, neuroscience that forces outside your ordinary awareness undermine claims to self-mastery and self-awareness. So, uh, in brief, the idea that if there are unconscious forces making your decisions for you before you become aware that the decision has happened, there's some sense then in which you're not acting freely because the decisions that you're making aren't occurring consciously, they're occurring even before you're consciously aware that you're making a decision. And so then the argument would go, how can you call that free when what you're getting is simply the outcome of forces that occur outside of your consciousness completely, not even available for reasoning until after you've already made your decisions and possibly uh, acted on them. In these deterministic views of action, freedom and self-understanding are illusory so that the, they arrive on the scene after everything significant has already happened, in other words, so that you get the illusion of having made a decision in a conscious, deliberate way when in fact that feeling of conscious deliberation is something that arrives late on the scene. So, um, uh, so in these views, um, action, freedom, and self-understanding are illusory, and when we relinquish them, we must also relinquish ideas of responsibility. Again, because if you're acting not under your own steam, not autonomously, not um, as a product of your own deliberation, and therefore you could not have acted otherwise than you did, in what sense are you responsible? And with it then, with the relinquishment of responsibility, you also have to give up the ethical domain as such. If, if nobody is responsible for the actions that they do, then in what sense can they be considered acting ethically or not? There's almost this uh, mechanistic understanding of action here, that this is just the unavoidable, inevitable outcome of forces that are not within your control. And so the idea then being, if it's not in your control, then you can't take responsibility for it, and therefore there's no uh, ethical weight for you to bear for your actions. And also then no ethical weight that you can uh, extend to someone else for his or her actions. Now, Keen responds by questioning whether reflexivity is a necessary precondition for ethics, even if it may play a, a catalyzing role in producing public knowledge that informs people's unselfconscious responses to others and to their actions. Public knowledge is important here. On its basis, you can expect others to recognize, as you do, actions that fall within the purview of ethics, right? That you have a shared understanding of what kind of a thing is an ethical action and what sorts of actions are, are not ethical in nature. So then to free ethics from the individualizing psychologism of the challenges above, these sort of deterministic uh, neuroscience-y kinds of challenges, Keen turns to the question of what sort of social circumstances induce reflexivity. 
So again, he's not abandoning the idea of ref reflexivity just to the individual isolated from others, but is situating reflexivity within social circumstances, right? So that again, he maintains this idea that ethics has a social nature that is inextricable from it. Following along these lines, he asserts that as an object of empirical research, ethics does not reduce to rationality. So then it's not just what Kant argues, because Kant argues for the privilege of rationality in arriving at things like the categorical imperative. Without ra rationality, you lose Kant's version of deontology entirely. So Keane is not persuaded by that. It doesn't, doesn't just reduce to rationality, doesn't just reduce to a special self-consciousness. Because ethics draw on a heterogeneous set of resources, the question is what groups any set together for some people in a given context. Our focus then must be on how social interactions produce ethical reflexivity because, quote, social interactions are the natural home of justifications, excuses, accusations, reason, praise, blame, and all the other ways in which ethics comes to be made explicit. Ethical affordances. This is his next topic. He draws on this idea, ethical affordances, in an effort to neutralize the determinism of the neuroscience psychology challenge to ethics. By ethical affordances, he means any aspect of people's experiences and perceptions that they might draw on in the process of making ethical evaluations and decisions, whether consciously or not. They have a couple of important features then affordances to. They're materially objective phenomena, not simply subjective phenomena, and they are affordances only in the light of a particular activity performed by another being. Another way to put this is that agency imbues a thing with the property of being an ethical affordance. It's not a property of a thing, so it's not intrinsic to the thing, but a potential that agency can unlock. Uh, so he takes the example of a surface that is um, horizontal, parallel to the ground, um, at roughly knee height, and he says that there's nothing intrinsic in this that makes it a good surface for someone to take a seat on, but when somebody comes upon it, and chooses to sit on it, so exercises agency with reference to it, it has this property, this affordance, that makes it a thing for sitting on. Doesn't need to be a chair, but it could be. Uh, by the same token, a chair might look for all the world like something that is built for sitting on, but one of its affordances, given an agent who wants to get something from a high shelf, is that you can also stand on it to make yourself tall enough to get the thing from the shelf, right? So again, it's not an intrinsic quality of the thing, it's a quality that agency brings out in the thing. Thus, Keane uh, points out, ethics has naturalistic components and they become properly ethical, not as the inevitable outcome of mechanical causes, the way a neuroscientist might uh, make the argument, but rather when an actor employs their available properties within a particular activity. Therefore, the actor's agency imbues them with affordance, makes of them ethical affordances. For these reasons, Keen finds the idea of affordance to do a better job of, quote, illuminating links between the particularities of social and historical circumstances, and the universal cognitive, affective, interactional, and other capacities on which ethical responses draw. He thinks that's better than the deterministic or constructivist theories of neuroscience or psychology.
So then explicitness, making um, ethical thinking or action available for reflection, depends on taking a third person stance from which arises social interaction. This in turn is connected to a staple of ethics, giving an account of oneself. That is, the idea that we are answerable to others. Again, this notion that ethics are social in nature so that uh, if responsibility is an aspect of ethics, is a social aspect of ethics, giving an account of oneself is one of the sort of paradigm examples of ethical behavior or ethical action. So then we're answerable to others. This implies first external instigation. I must feel myself faced with another, another person say, before I feel compelled to account for myself. Just inside my own head, I may not feel any um, requirement to give an account of myself. When I'm faced with another, <clears throat> that's when I can feel that I need to give an account of myself. Second, <clears throat> causality as it relates to my compulsion to give an account, I do offer an excuse or, a, uh, so as an example, do I offer an excuse or a justification? Do I feel compelled to? If so, what's the cause? of that compulsion. And third, responsibility. I, and not some other entity or force, caused this to happen and its implication, punishment, forgiveness, and so forth. Uh, so we're going to come back to the topic of excuses and justifications. Um, I'm flagging this in advance here because I, I want to keep them in mind for later on. That this is uh, the kind of thing, this is the kind of form that an account of oneself can take. An apology could be another form that giving an account of oneself uh, could take. Social interaction is inextricable throughout. He says, I address someone to whom I owe an account. There's this sense then of obligation to another. To respond to this centrality of social interaction, Keane directs his attention to ordinary interactions, knowing that their power lies in their very ubiquity. So then the social is um, an intrinsic part of ethics, but it's not some isolated social realm where ethics lives. Ethics rather are ordinary in nature. They arise in um, all sorts of the most innocent seeming social interactions. So then a consequence of locating explicitness, responsibility, self-accounting, ethics as a whole in social interaction is that it over, out, uh, is that its outcomes are never entirely in any one party's hands. They are social in nature, also in the sense that the way that they are negotiated, never rests solely with one actor or one agent. They're always negotiated socially. In short then, to sum up, sum up so far, an account stems from some kind of instigation. Something instigates the account. Self-accounting does not require extraordinary circumstances, but rather appears in everyday settings. Self-accounting entails maneuvers bearing on one's responsibilities, so justifications or excuses. The power of the maneuvers lies in their very ordinariness and ubiquity. You could say, to take his language from earlier, their publicness, that, that they are publicly available. And finally, they spur self-awareness, which is prompted by the need to respond to other people. So that ethics is not exclusively responsive, but that it is, that there is a responsive quality to it. It occurs with at least two people.
It's never reducible just to a single individual. Now, typically, it's when people feel a need or need to allocate responsibility for an action that one feels a need to give an account of oneself. Now, something that he doesn't say uh, explicitly as far as I recall, uh, but that you can add here, is that you yourself might be the one in the presence of another who feels the need to allocate that responsibility. And so you might give an account of yourself um, not because someone else has demanded it of you, but because you're in the presence of someone and you feel the obligation in that person's presence to allocate responsibility to yourself for an action and therefore give the account. To get at what this looks like though, Keane turns to J.L. Austin's writing on excuses. So Austin was a, a British philosopher in Oxford, Cambridge, I don't remember which. Anyway, a uh, British philosopher um, in the uh, 19, what, 50s and 60s, I think. In any case, he wrote about excuses and Keane draws on his writing to try, try and get clear what this notion of uh, allocating responsibility and giving an account of oneself what that looks like. In answer to Austin's question of when we excuse conduct, Keane does not offer a programmatic answer as if there's this one size fits all answer, but considers the general answer. <clears throat> that is, when someone has accused an, uh, another of doing something bad or wrong, that that is instructive. When, when that scene arises, that is instructive. It's not then that all peoples across time and space find exactly the same things to be wrong, untoward, unwelcome, but rather that ethical descriptions of actions, that is, attaching responsibility to actors for their actions, that is ubiquitous in human sociality. The difference between justifications and excuses captures part of this. But even should they be culturally specific, say, to the realm of the English-speaking world, Keane argues that the profound lesson for us is that ethics do not find their home in, as he puts it, the individual autonomous mind, but in palpable social interactions, especially as they appear in verbal interaction. So if you follow Austin's uh, line of thinking on this, he'll, he'll note that somebody who gives a justification for having acted in a particular way is someone who feels entitled to have acted in that way. And therefore, you're justified, you're offering, offering a justification, so that there's uh, built into that a refusal to take responsibility for a particular action because you don't feel that blame can be assigned to you for it. You were justified in acting in such and such a way. So um, what, could, what could be an example of this? Um, you were justified in uh, pushing someone off a sidewalk, let's say. Well, now, how could that be? It seems on the face of it, if you're pushing someone off a sidewalk, you're, you're putting them in danger, say, of getting hit by a car or uh, something like that. But it may be that the reason that you push the person is that that individual uh, was absorbed maybe in a smartphone doing something and didn't notice that there was a pit directly in their path and they were about to step into, into it and the only thing you could do for whatever reason is push them uh, so that they didn't step into that pit and and suffer the consequences of that. So then you might say, well, I was justified in doing that. Or it might be that as um, an aspect of a particular office that you hold, that you're justified in doing certain kinds of things that other people are not um, justified in doing. So that would be one thing. Excuses, on the other hand, 
are a way of accepting responsibility, but saying that uh, the consequences should be mitigated for you in some way, that there were mitigating circumstances, that you did something, uh, but you, you have an excuse. There's a, a reason that you did it, not one that nullifies your responsibility, but one that um, should be considered when, um, when it comes time to assign the particular sanctions that you're going to blame, and, and that that consideration should reduce the punishment that you face. So both of those then you could see as ways of giving an account of yourself in the face of an accusation and um, they, they lead though in different directions. Following from this, what Keane has just entertained and in his consideration of Garfinkel's experiment with his students where he had his students um, just for a 15 minute period start behaving toward the other members of their household as if they were boarders within that household and and seeing how it just created uh, mayhem for that even that brief period because suddenly the way the people were interacting with one another felt completely alien and frankly insulting to uh, to for example the parents of these students so following that example, Keane presses the point that the ethical is not some special, distinct realm of social interaction, but it's a feature of even the most superficial forms of behavior. Uh, he takes as another example um, Starbucks and getting coffee at Starbucks so that on the one hand, there's the expectation that the barista will have a certain kind of expertise and one aspect of that expertise is a command of the vocabulary that goes with preparing the range of different drinks that they have in the different sizes that they have and employing that specialized vocabulary in the presence of people who are ordering possibly not using that vocabulary so that it can become an ethically charged environment because the customer can also feel like, what? why are you trying to make me feel stupid for ordering my coffee by responding with all of this uh, fancy language when asking for a single shot of espresso is perfectly clear. It doesn't require any further explanation. Uh, so that like, hey, I'm the customer, treat me with respect. So you have that on the one side and then on the other side you have the barista who's supposed to have this kind of expertise, who is supposed as part of the job to, uh, to, to translate orders into the language of that expertise, and then is supposed to exercise that expertise in making the particular drink according to particular expectations. So that you get, um, e even in as ordinary uh, an exchange as ordering a coffee, you can get this ethically charged uh, environment and you can get responses, ethical responses from both sides of the counter. Keen then returns to the first person, third person contrast uh, that he opened the essay with, recalling the one as embedded in the habitual and unselfconscious flow of life and the other as rules, principles, norms that demand self, the self-awareness of uh, individuals. Having just considered excuses though, he adds to our ethical consideration, the second person, the you, whether in singular or plural, given the importance of addressing a specific person or specific people, say, who have leveled a response, uh, who have leveled an accusation of some sort toward you, and the accusation then requires a response. And so here you get first person, second person interaction. I address you when I feel compelled to make an account of myself. I don't address myself to the third person, I address myself 
to the second person. Now, he, however, he notes a specific quality of the third person stance, attaching a name from an ethical lexicon to a feature of ordinary interaction, right? So that you take um, a name from within this lexicon, within this vocabulary, this ethical vocabulary, and you attach it to a particular uh, event or a particular action within social interaction in such a way that that becomes something of ethical consideration. These come together in an interesting way when, for example, we consider the idea of dignity. So dignity, something that we get from Immanuel Kant, so it could be simply a deontological um, category of thought, a deontological principle, or concept. It could then simply be this sort of third person, um, uh, third person concept. So then it's, for Keen though, it's not just that the name taken from the third person stance for an ethically relevant feature of everyday life but it's also the basis on which I in the first person or we in the first person demand of you in the second person a certain quality of treatment. When I demand that you acknowledge my inherent dignity, I'm demanding that you treat me in a certain way. It is therefore interactive. Drawing on other co concepts taken from other places like Dewa or Punen, uh, from his field work among Sumba or Sumbanese people and Howells among uh, Chawang, he demonstrates how concepts foreign to Euro-Americans have the same interactive structure. So it's not that the concepts are the same, but the interactive structure is the same. That, he says, objectifies a particular viewpoint on people's ethical vulnerability to one another. So this notion then of ethics being interactive, socially interactive, always, and of containing one's vulnerability to another. Why? Because one can always be demanded to give an account of oneself. That was an ugly way of putting that. Others can always demand of you that you give an account. You're vulnerable to that demand that you give an account of yourself. The premise that ethics has a history starts with the idea that an emotion, say something like anger, that's an example he gives, only has an ethical or moral quality if the thing provoking the anger is something about which it is ethically sensible to be angry. Okay, so, so far though, that sounds like something that is not necessarily historical in nature. That could be just that Humans respond to particular kinds of situations whenever they occur in history, making them ahistorical in particular ways. That certain kinds of things, always, everywhere, for everyone, have provoked a kind of righteous anger, let's say. But not all anger is going to be ethical in nature. So perhaps I... Uh, uh, perform badly in some kind of sport that I'm playing or, um, or I lose a bet and I become angry about that. Uh, th that anger can, can be perfectly legitimate without being ethical in any way. There's, there's not a kind of moral aspect to it. Uh, I'm not angry then at being wronged. There's nobody I, there's nobody from whom I demand an account right? There's nobody who takes responsibility in this ethical sense for that. On the other hand, if I lost because an opponent cheated or because the betting system was rigged to ensure that I or others lose, then there's this sense that somebody stands in need of, of giving an account. Somebody stands responsible for this set of circumstances. Someone has wronged me in some way. Now my anger becomes ethically relevant. To the extent then that anger and uh, other emotions like that uh, is part of a vocabulary that objectifies something 
as conceptually ethical, then it is significantly ethical. The list of examples that Keen offers, dignity, respect, dewa, punen, and anger as well, signals that uh, what will fall into this objectifying vocabulary is not given once and for all, nor is it a set of universal concepts adopted by all peoples in all places at all times. He says, each term like dignity or dewa makes, uh, takes its meaning from its place within a larger constellation of ethical and psychological concepts, practices, and institutions. These are the contexts within which something does or does not make sense to have a particular moral emotion about. He goes on to take the emergence of concepts and the attachment of specific emotions like anger, outrage, indignation, so forth, the attachment of those emotions to these concepts with the consciousness raising practices of the feminist movement as an example of how we can chart a history of ethics through the production of ethical concepts that make the taken for granted available for examination and critique. So that if you have at one point in time the notion that, well, it's just obvious that women uh, lack the particular constitution necessary to be judges on the Supreme Court, or perhaps in any other court within the U.S., I would say that this is a part of the history, then you can see how the move that he's making is to say there comes an historical moment when that taken for granted perception becomes available for examination and critique. It's lifted out of its taken for grantedness and exposed to criticism. The underlying principles are available for examination. And along with that, then you can get the attachment of particular emotions like outrage that that is the current situation of that that is the current set of taken for granted principles and through that they can be um, transformed that a new kind of ethical disposition can arise out of that critique so then from within specific social interaction new conceptual objects like the sexist form and with them new ethical possibilities so that when uh, a, a sexist person becomes a publicly available concept uh, an individual who is open to, to critique then through that through the creation of that object and the critique surrounding that object you get a new kind of uh, possibility for indignation at this person's insistence that this is say just the natural order of things and through the critique of that person you get the new kind of ethical possibility uh, ethical possibilities say like the insistence on uh, a greater egalitarianism about what sorts of uh, positions are available to people of different races, different genders, and so forth. That this is, then is how new eth ethical possibilities come into being historically. Keen takes us back to Foucault. So we've been, we, we visited Foucault already several times. Again, he figures as an important um, uh, individual in Keen's thinking. Um, he goes back to Foucault's assumption that being ethical depends on some degree of freedom from determining influences on our action. So again, pushing back against the uh, presumptions that you find in certain neuroscientific critiques of, say, free will, and that this freedom turns on the capacity for reflection. So that, that's Foucault's uh, position as Keen is, is considering it. Keen adds, if ethics depends on the freedom that is made possible by reflection, 
then the fundamental cognitive capacity for self-distancing that all humans possess and its development through self-other dynamics is an ethical affordance. So here he's bringing the idea of for affordance back into the conversation. And, and we're starting now, I think, to see how he's packaging the ideas of first, second, and third person along with affordance and social interaction to sort of flesh out his idea of ethics. Self-distancing can turn the flow of action into an object of thought. So that if you can take yourself cognitively out of a particular situation, take some distance from it, look at how you acted and how others acted within that interaction, then it can become an object for consideration, reflection, and uh, analysis. So self-distancing can turn the flow of action into an object of thought, allowing the cognitive process of objectification, the resulting third person stance, and the semiotic, uh, semiotics is the study of signs, so language would be a system of signs. The semiotic means it rests on to become devices for ethical life, so that we have then the vocabulary that is publicly shared that we can draw on to describe this object that uh, becomes available to us through self-distancing. Having said this, Keane warns us um, these processes, affordances, and devices do not necessarily produce a coherent and co consistent ethical whole. Right? This is part of what Kant was striving for with deontology was to get a kind of seamless, completely contained uh, moral system with, with no sort of leftovers, no niggling little bits that are fringes on the outside, that it, that it, it is completely coherent, self-contained, consistent, invariant. Keen's saying that the processes that he's talking about here don't necessarily produce a coherent and cons consistent ethical whole. That if that's our expectation, we're going to be disappointed. This holds for morality systems as well, though, whose high degree of visibility, they're highly visible. Why? Because they have rituals attached to them. There are rules associated with them. Again, think deontology. Uh, there are texts describing them. Uh, you could think of religious texts as a kind of paradigm example. Uh, there are authorities and institutions associated with, um, with moral systems. They can mislead us then, because of their high visibility, into thinking that they are inevitable and consistent and that they are the whole of the game of ethics. That ethics is entire, the, the entire surface area of ethics is covered by moral systems. It can appear that way. Keane thinks that this is something, again, through Bernard Williams, that we need to critique. Um, but he doesn't deny that this is the appearance that we can get about moral systems. Their appearance of stability and inevitability can also make it hard to understand how ethics are open to change. This is his point about his, uh, the historical aspect of ethics. If they're not open to change, then they also can't be historical. They can't emerge through history. That would constitute a change. So we, we can see how this stands against a number of things that he's lined up uh, for his understanding of ethics. Um, and in particular, it makes it hard to see how people individually and collectively can generate projects that produce change in moral systems or ethics. And again, he's pointed to the feminist movement as a concrete example of how projects have produced ethical change and therefore how ethics have history, how they are historical. As Keane points out, morality systems are the project, products of such projects. In this way, they're historical. As he puts it, they are expressions of historical agency. 
He brings us back to the central contrast then between moral systems and ethics. The first have this juridical character, rules, punishment, rituals, regulation, norms, and so forth, that they have this kind of godlike judge associated with them. Well, the second, ethics, involves, this is a quote, involves the growth or cultivation of persons guided by models or concepts of human flourishing that vary according to the social and historical context. And he takes then, Keen does, virtue ethics as the paradigm example of ethics. We've seen virtue ethics uh, come up in previous pieces. I won't revisit it here. Keen, though, is in line with uh, some of the other reading that we've already encountered then that takes virtue ethics as a particularly instructive site of understanding ethics as distinct from moral sy morality systems. The taken for granted, which Keane presents as this kind of repository for ethics, even if we can't articulate it because it's taken for granted and that obscures it from us, he thinks that it's this repository for ethics, is open to transformation as we objectify its historical objects. So as we bring them into visibility that allows them to, uh, to become objectified and available for critique, the possibility for transformation comes along with that. Further, because it is mediated semiotically, again, remember semiotics, sign systems, language being a sign system, so because no, semiotics can have other sign systems as well, language is just one particular kind of example. Because then it's also mediated semiotically, it is never just cognitive. Why? Because sign systems are public, they are shared, they have to be shared. They are social in nature, never simply the product of an individual mind. They're, so they're not just cognitive. It is also then inseparable from material and social practices. We can see how a feedback loop forms here. People draw on the affordances available in psychological propensities, patterns of social interaction, concepts, uh, institutions to produce historical objects. As these objects become part of the taken for granted background, they provide affordances of their own allowing for further innovation, and so forth. In this section, first, second, and third person stances, Keane focuses on the entwinement of the different stances. On the one side, pressures to conform, norm seeking, and other third person qualities are chronically, arise chronically in interaction. Right? We, we run into them all the time. Every time we express an expectation of others, we're drawing on these third-person qualities. On the other side, though, interaction itself entails the first and second person, justifying, accusing, excusing, denying. All of these things like this draw on a public reservoir of concepts, but take place in the for, in forms of address from first person to second person. So I justi justify myself to others drawing on public notions of justifiable action. I don't get to decide on my own individually what a justifiable action is. I appeal to what is publicly available as justifiable action or what publicly is available to justify an action. I can further extend the range of application of these public concepts by making a persuasive case that they are recognizable, but they have untapped potential uh, beyond the particular domains of their use currently. This is something else that we're going to come back to when we read Vina Das's work next on this um, idea of, say, uh, a word being able, that, that you can project a word into new circumstances 
for new uses. That, that that domain of their use is never fixed and closed off once and for all, that it is intrinsically open to expansion and for uh, redirection. Innovation then is possible. Still though, he notes that the first and second person stances appear within interaction while the third person is outside interaction creating a persistent tension among these three. Such tension allows for um, unexpected or for some counterintuitive understandings of the ethical. Hence, we cannot expect that the facts will ultimately assure, uh, assure us that all people will define the good in ways we recognize or that they will eventually converge on values that we can accept. So then this intrinsic openness that is the product of the tension between third person, first person, and second person means that there's this possibility of different peoples arriving at different notions of the good that may be unrecognizable from another stance. And yet, he's not convinced that we're simply condemned to an amoral relativism. This idea that um, the good is always and only, so to speak, culturally defined. That the good belongs to a specific culture, whatever a specific, specific culture might be, uh, and that some other culture will find it completely alien. Again, this is something that we're going to revisit in a different way in Vina Dasa's work. So he's not, he doesn't think that we're just condemned to that as, as if um, nobody can have a say about ethics as they occur among some other people. Because uh, the third person stance is not the entirety of ethical life. So then rules, norms, uh, pressure to conform, that these are not the entirety of ethical life. Indeed, giving expression to the third person stance occurs in the first person to the second person. We can understand the ethical games of others, even when we're not invested in the outcomes of those games. And we will preoccupy ourselves with the outcomes of the games to which we are committed. So um, you could imagine, for example, that um, say there are uh, active debates around the nature and importance of the Last Supper within or between specific Christian uh, denominations. Now, if you are not Christian, say you're an atheist or you're Buddhist or uh, Jane or something else. You can understand what's going on in those debates, even though you don't feel that you have a stake in their outcome, that th that's going to be for them to decide. It's not going to affect my life. Um, so I can understand the nature of the debate. Say, as, as an atheist, I can understand the nature of the debate around uh, questions of the Last Supper. Um, or around the Trinity, or what, whatever, whatever it might be. There, there's no shortage of topics of debate within religions, of course. Um, and so I can recognize the parameters of the debate. I can recognize the positions and understand uh, how those positions are coherent to the people who hold them. I can understand what's at stake for the people who are debating these things. And yet I might feel like, well, I can understand all that, but I don't have a stake in it. I'm not committed to that game. I'm committed to other games, and so other ethical games, that is. And so those are the ones that will uh, concern me, where I'll feel that I have a stake. So then there's no reason to think that uh, we arrive at a final ethical resting point, even within the ethical games that concern us. They're not static, 
because the relations between first, second, and third person stances are not stable. They're open to change. And as he's pointed out, ethics emerge historically. The way I address you with respect to third person concepts does not guarantee the unaltered continuation of those concepts, even as I draw on them and you comprehend them. They are, again, open-ended. They can be projected into new circumstances. They can be objectified in new ways to allow them to become available for analysis and critique. When people act or live in ways taken to be ethical, Keane says, those notions concern values or ideas about rightness and wrongness. When other people, in turn, respond to those actors or ways of living, they are guided partly by how they do or do not make sense for, uh, of those ideas. Ethical life is not just a matter of knowing the rules of the game. It is being committed enough to that game to care about how it turns out. So that uh, coming back to a notion that he introduced quite a bit earlier, that the emotional response that you have is part of the ethical game not external to it. It's not just reducible to a kind of reasoned understanding of what the rules are, but it's also about this question of commitment. So that, that is where Keane leaves us for now. Um, hopefully we can see from this some of the kinds of things that as ethnographers we want to tune into when we're talking to people and uh, trying to get a bead on what they take to be ethically significant, even if they're not using a vocabulary that sounds explicitly ethical, like in the case of ordering a coffee uh, and, and having this feeling of disgruntlement uh, between you and the barista. So then we want to start attuning ourselves to the way that people are expressing themselves about ethical questions along these, the kinds of lines then that Keen is trying to alert us to.